talking about my talk, uh, he asked me an interesting question. And this question was, can big pharma, can all the big pharma go exponential? So let's start by maybe framing the problem. You have on this slide a few of the uh, molecules that have transformed human medicine, you know, from aspirin, Lipitor, Prozac. The big challenge with developing molecule for big pharma is that the process is very, very slow. It's very expensive, and it's basically a trial and error problem. So why is it very slow? Because if on any of those molecules, you just change one atom, change an H for CH3, change any atom, you have to restart everything. You have no way to learn how this mo new molecule is going to be effective or it's going to be toxic. So you have to restart from zero in animal models, in clinical trials. And so the process for the last 150 years has been about trying and failing, which is why big pharma tries literally millions of compounds before one ends up being an approved product. So despite huge advancement, huge impact on patients around the world, this has been a very, very slow process. So is there a better way? So we believe at Moderna that there is a new age for medicine that is digital medicine. So let me maybe take you back a little bit to the basics of biology. So the dogma of biology is in each of your cells you have DNA. Every time your cells need a new protein made, it basically gets a copy only of that message, a copy of that gene in the molecule called the messenger RNA. It goes from the nucleus of your cell inside the cytoplasm of your cells, and using your ribosome machinery, it makes a protein. This is what kids now learn in sixth grade. And so this process happens more than a trillion times a day in every one of your cells. You basically are a protein factory. So the entire biotech industry since Genentech in the 70s went making proteins the very hard way, which is using a bacteria to code a human gene. So think like human insulin, code a human gene inside the bacteria to the bacteria make a lot of human insulin in a tank, then you have to purify the human insulin, put in a syringe, and you inject a diabetes patient. Huge impact on society. Well, the only challenge is this is really, really hard to do. You have around 22,000 protein in your body. They are only, now 40 years after the beginning of the biotech industry, only around 80 products that have been approved by the FDA out of 22,000 protein because it's a very, very hard process. So in the 80s, the academic and pharma world tried to do gene therapy, basically you know, going after the DNA. And that is very complicated, it's pretty dangerous. You know, cancer is a disease of the genome, so playing with DNA is not very good. Uh, and so while there's been a few attempts for rare diseases, not a lot of drugs have made it to market. Actually, no drugs in the US have made it to market in the last 40 years. Only one drug in Europe has been approved. But nobody has tried the messenger RNA. And why is that? Well, the reason is very simple. Viruses are made of mRNA. It was thought for the last 40 years in the clinical academic field that if you inject a synthetic made mRNA into an animal or into a human, you have very strong immune response. Why? Because the immune system of your body will think it's a virus. And so the entire field abandoned mRNA and went into making proteins the hard way. So there was some interesting discovery a few years back that showed that actually if you modify in a certain way the mRNA, you can trick the immune system so that your immune system will not think that synthetic mRNA we just made for you is a virus. And so that mRNA will get inside your cells and will make any protein we want on demand. So think about it as mRNA being software. You send a set of instructions, a message, to your cells that make any protein you want on demand. So use the, the, the human body as a protein factory. So there are three things that really excite us about the whole idea of using messenger RNA as a medicine. The first one is the ability to do thousands of drugs that are undoable today. Why? Because no current technology can get a protein made inside your cell. If you inject a protein using recombinant technology, 
your protein goes into circulation. It stays inside your blood. So it's great for insulin, it's great for EPO, it's great for growth hormone, it's great for a lot of things. But two thirds of the protein in your cells never leave your cell. They stay inside your cell. They are intracellular protein. So using recombinant technology, those things are totally undruggable. So this is one of the things that really excites us. The other thing that really excites us is the ability to do combination. We can mix three, four, five mRNAs in a single vial. And there are a lot of diseases for which a single drug doesn't work. Think about it, when you get a flu infection, what your immune system does, it's gonna make a soup of antibodies, not one, just dozens and dozens of antibodies. Well, we can now replicate that using mRNA. We can make antibodies encoded by mRNAs, we mix them in a single dose, and we can make 5, 10, 15 antibodies on demand in a single dose. That's a huge impact for infectious disease, you know, HIV, Ebola, huge impact for immuno-oncology. The second thing is speed, of course. What we have seen so far, and the company is only you know, four years old, what we have seen so far is the discovery process, the process to go from an idea to a drug ready to go start clinical trial, usually lasts you know, in big pharma 24 to 60 months, two to five years. In our hands with this new technology, because it's like software, because once you made it work once, to do the second and the third drug is much easier because the only thing you change is the sequence on the message. We're able to get drugs done in as short as six months from an idea to the drug ready to be able, a drug candidate, to move into the clinic. So that has a huge impact. And of course, the, the speed impact has a huge impact on cost because the R&D cost has a huge element of the final cost of a drug. So if you can shorten the, the time to develop a drug, you can reduce the overall investment from the pharmaceutical company. And the other thing that is very exciting for us is that we believe that the cost of those medicines will be roughly one-tenth of a drug or making a protein. So again, huge impact, because every drug is made in the same way. We make mRNA for insulin, like we made mRNA for growth hormone, or for EPO, or pick your favorite protein. So what is interesting is when we started the companies four years ago, we were not really thinking about it in those terms, but then six months, nine months into the company, it just hit us. Geez, we are at the very beginning of a major S-shaped curve, because nobody has done mRNA drugs before. So when you think about any technology that mankind has touched for the last you know, hundreds of years, at the beginning, the performance is always very weak. And when you start to have you know, academics, people from industry starting to work, investing a lot of human capital and financial capital behind any technology, after you know, six months, 12 months, 18 months, you start to see really exponential growth in that performance of that technology. Because a lot of smart people are starting to solve difficult scientific technical problems. And here we are seeing the same thing, which is we are just at the beginning of a huge inflection point. Uh, and this has driven us to make two big business strategic decisions. The first one, pretty atypical for a small biotech company, invest massively in IT and automation. Because you're going to want to be able to learn faster than anybody. And so the ability to get data, analyze big data, look at trends, and be able to automatize everything to ensure high quality and short cycle time is going to give you leverage. Because we don't think about it in terms of six months or 12 months, we think about it in terms of 20 years. Which is if a process of 60 days, you reduce a day or two days or five days over 20 year cycles, you can learn much, much faster. The other one was how do we create a network effect? How do we create, like the guys in tech have done, in the biotech world, a network effect so that we can learn very fast? Because if you can learn fast because of a network effect and you combine this with a lot of IT data capture, then you have a winning proposition. So what we started to do is to think about how do you design a drug in a few minutes. So I have a short video to show you how we do that now at Moderna. Messenger RNA creates therapeutic proteins and, like software, contains instructions which direct cellular ribosomal machinery. The Drug Design Studio accelerates the drug development process by enabling scientists to design, optimize, and order mRNA therapeutics in minutes for delivery in weeks through an encrypted web portal and secure private cloud. A scientist can select any protein in the human proteome, design novel proteins like antibodies, traps, or fusion proteins, or explore previously undruggable pathways. Users can design the mRNA RNA to tune protein expression, target specific tissues, and optimize mRNA properties. 
The studio integrates with Moderna's automation platforms, directing orders through each phase of mRNA synthesis. Once the order is placed, the scientist will receive the mRNA drug in just weeks. The Drug Design Studio is the front end to Moderna's highly scalable, fully automated, high-throughput mRNA production facility, allowing users to design and begin production of one or dozens of constructs in a matter of minutes. This is quite unbelievable. I mean, we are able to design a drug in a few minutes because today the entire human proteome is on the internet. So we have those search toolbox, as you saw on the top right of the screen, where you can type the name of any protein, like insulin, and you'll get in real time all the variants of all the mutations of insulin that have been documented by humankind. And then you can just pick with your mouse which one you like, you design your experiment, you click order, and it goes to a set of robots, because that's the other piece we did, we built a farm of robots. So basically we have a room roughly half the size of this room, that is on shift, starting at 5 o'clock in the morning until 11 p.m., just cranking mRNA. And the great thing now is we know how to scale. So this is uh, the real data of what we were able to do. So if you want, last year, in December 2014, we could make 50 mRNA a month. Now we're in the process of finishing the year, being able to make roughly 1,000 mRNA a month, and we know exactly how to scale. If we want to do 10x more, we know how many robots we need to buy, we know how many employees we need to have, and we can just scale the whole process. The other piece is about the network effect, which was a bit less intuitive at the beginning. And the whole idea was the following, which is, if you have this S-shaped curve and you push the technology very hard, you will be able, like in the tech world, to do release of your technology, a 1.0, a 2.0, a 3.0, where basically you're gonna have, every time you have some material improvement of the technology, be able to release that to the users. In our case, the users are the drug developers. They use the technology to make medicines. And we said, how do we create literally 50 or 100 different programs being done in parallel so that we can learn massively instead of doing things in, in series like it's done by Big Pharma? And so what we started to do is to do partnership. We did partnership with Merck, with AstraZeneca, with Alexion, we have a few more in negotiation as we speak. Because the whole idea of this platform, given it's the same core technology, like an mRNA operating system, to do any drugs, Every time you sign a new partner, we bring another you know, 50, 100 million dollars of technology access fee. All that money goes back into pushing the OS. As you push the OS, you create the network effect and you create the virtuous cycle, which is why creating a network effect for us was critical. And so the, the proof in the pudding is this slide, which is, again, the company was started in the summer of 2011. We had no lab, no equipment, nothing. Now we are literally you know, four years after and we have 60 drugs in flight. And the crazy thing about it is we could have 200 drugs in flight tomorrow because there's 22,000 in the human proteome. We're just limited now by our ability to just do that well, to, to build the right animal model, to build the right assay so that we can prosecute those drugs moving forward. So let me give you an example. So I talked about making mRNAs coding for human protein, mRNA coding for antibodies. So this is an mRNA coding for a vaccine. So it's a totally different use of, again, the same toolbox. So how do you do, instead of putting the message for human protein, like insulin, you put the message for the antigen of a virus. And in this example, we see it's an example of flu. So this is H1N1, you know, the swine flu. And what you see here that's interesting, if you look in dark gray, this is the typical performance of a vaccine that most of you got a flu shot for. It takes roughly five weeks to get protection. The protection is the red line on the graph. Uh, and as you can see, the, the y-axis is uh, a log scale. Our, our two vaccines that we developed here in light blue and dark blue are very, very low doses. is eight microgram of material per individual. Eight microgram. With a ton of mRNA, you can vaccinate a few people. What you can see on the log scale is that we're actually roughly 100 times better in terms of we make 100 times more antibodies to protect you against an infection. But the most important piece for me for patients is the fact that we are protective after one week. Commercial vaccine for all the technologies available today is five weeks. It's after one week. Think about the impact in terms of millions of lives during a pandemic. When we saw this data, we couldn't believe it. So what did we do? We went and we tried the lethal challenge, which is give the animals a very high dose to see if they survive or if they are protected by the vaccine. And you can see on the top right graph, 
The, the animals protected by our vaccine, 100% survival. We have not tested it for Ebola and a lot of other diseases, same thing, 100% survival. The animals that are unprotected, injected with water, 90% dead after one week, one dose, no need for a boost. So what we have done so far, if you want, is try to build this company that is going to bring dozens and dozens of drugs in the clinic over the coming years, making mRNA the operating system behind the company and enabling the drugs going to market to the patients by a mix of our own ventures, those are our own companies that are just doing drug development. So Onkaido is in oncology, Valera is infectious disease, Capana is personalized oncology vaccine, where we make a vaccine just for you, for your own tumor, from a sequence of your tumor, and PDR is for rare disease. Uh, we have 320 people, we have raised more than a billion dollars of capital so far, and in January of this year, we announced the biggest private biotech financing ever, and we'll be in a clinic very soon. We have also partnership with, with DARPA, uh, so, one of the things that excites me the most is what is going to come in the next 10 years. Not only in terms of Moderna, which is the piece we talked about, but in terms of what's happening to biology. For the first time in my career, I am seeing exponential growth of the understanding that we have of biology. I have a chance to live in Boston. I work in you know, downtown you know, Cambridge in Kendall Square. There's not a week that goes by now where a new groundbreaking paper comes that makes us rethink how we think about biology, not a week. And this could not have happened this before. It's because now we have technology like sequencing, and the cost of sequencing is so cheap. We have the entire human genome, proteome, big data, AI. All this is available. And you start to see this whole body of knowledge coming together, enabling new inventions at a crazy speed. The piece I tell a lot of time our employees to stay modest and humble is the company could have existed five, ten years ago. We are lucky now. We sequence every mRNA we make. It costs me five dollars. A few years ago, it would have been $50,000, $100,000 for QC of every product, undoable. We don't have to guess the, the protein. As I told you, we just go into the internet and you find any protein of the human genome since the, the sequencing of the human genome. So all that information now that's freely available enables us to invent new medicine. Financing is also uh, extremely available uh, for disruptive technology. If you're just looking, just in Boston, just in the first nine months of this year, the four big VC biotech uh, funds have raised more than $2 billion of fresh capital. So it's a huge amount of money, especially if you think about the leverage you can get from that. Again, if I take Moderna as an example, we had only $12 million in the company history of VC money, but we raised a billion of capital. So just think about the leverage that can be gained from that $2 billion if it is wisely invested in disruptive technology with leverage from big pharma dollars and institutional investors' dollars. I think that this country is best positioned in the world by a long shot to bring digital medicine uh, to patients. The rule of law of this country, the quality of graduate school, the quality of academic research is incomparable in the world. VC financing, we just spoke about, talent, uh, and risk-taking mindset. I'm convinced that if I had started Moderna in Europe or in Asia, where I lived for five years, the company would not be one-tenth of what Moderna is today. This country is unbelievable to be able to think big, to take risk, to believe in people, and this is why I think we are at the beginning of an incredible journey of biology. We are so lucky to live in a world right now. Thank you very much. So, quick question. You said you guys started 2011? Yes. And what was the size of your Series A? Two million dollars. And your Series B? Twelve. And then I thought you just raised like 500 million recently. Yes, but not from VCs. Not from VCs. So it's too, we are too expensive for VCs. Exponential funding. And um, when do you think your uh, first mRNA therapeutics will enter, uh, enter the market? So in the market, the current timeline is around 2019 for rare disease. Excellent. Great. Watch this space. Thanks so much. Thank you. Cheers.